Okay, so we are Genesis chapter 3, verses 9 through 19. Then the Lord God called, a man to, called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and thus you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread, till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Like some of you, I was born in the 1900s. And back then, things were radically different. When I was a kid, I spent a good amount of time uh, playing outside in the street with my friends, unsupervised. And sometimes I would venture far away from my house without let, letting my mom know where I was going or how long would I stay there. So I was just out, I was just gone. And you know, in the process of just exploring the neighborhood, I used to cross major avenues and high traffic streets on a bicycle or a scooter or on foot without a helmet, of course. And those were, of course, very different times, very different times indeed. And then one day when I was about 11 or 12, uh, my mom asked me to go get some bread, fresh bread from the bakery. So this establishment was conveniently located about a mile away from my house. And the only problem was that to get there, I had to cross a major avenue, something comparable to the width of Preston Road, except with a much larger middle, uh, median in the middle. So it was six lanes of traffic, a median, and you know I had to cross that to get to the bakery. So my mom gave me some money, and she asked me to go to the bakery, but she said, make sure you cross through the crosswalk. So then on the way there, I did exactly as my mother said. I went through the crosswalk. Made my, it made my walk a little bit longer because I had to go a little bit to the east and then cross and then come back you know, west. But I did as she said. But on the way back, I thought, you know what? I'm, I just want to get home. I'm tired. So, so I didn't cross through the sidewalk. I, cross, I decided to cross the avenue at the shortest and most convenient spot that would allow me to you know, spend less time outside and get home faster. So traffic, as usual, in this avenue was heavy. And I had to run full speed if I was going to start dodging the, the cars because I was away from the crosswalk and the, the traffic lag was far from where I was. So, so I was going to have to run really fast to make it there. So when the time was right, I ran as fast as I could. and. When I reached the median, as soon as I reached the median, I felt this hard punch to my throat. Actually, the impact was so strong that I fell on my back. And it was a miracle that I didn't actually land on the road. Uh, rather, I landed right on, on the median. Um, if I had landed on the road, I would just have been killed by the passing cars. So as I'm trying to make sense of what had just happened, I felt a stinging pain on my neck. And, and when I touched it, I immediately realized that, that I I had a massive cut on my throat, and it was bleeding profusely. I had, I had to run straight home. I mean, I had to run. I had run straight into a barbed wire. That's what happened. So they had recently placed this barbed wire to protect the green areas that they had just planted some flowers and grass. And, and um, 
So I remember I'm, I'm touching there my neck and it's feeling like it's burning and the blood is coming out. And I had never seen so much blood coming out of my body before. So I, I, I kept my hand there. I got up. I don't remember what happened to the bread. I think it stayed there. <laughs> and, and I ran to my home as fast as I could. So when I get there, I frantically knock on the door. And then my mother opens the door, exasperated, like, what is your problem? And then I remove my hand and I tell my mom I got hurt. So I had a, I had a four inch cut from one side of my neck to the other. And the doctor said when he saw me that I had a chunk of flesh missing right on top of my jugular vein, but I didn't puncture it, thank God. And, you know, it took over 40 stitches to repair the damage caused by my disobedience because I did not follow the instructions. So most likely my mom knew that the barbed wire was there, so you need to go through the, through the crosswalk. But I didn't. I didn't ask and I just didn't obey. And 34 years later, I still bear the mark that reminds me of the severe consequences of disobedience, consequences that sometimes could result in death. So today, we are going to talk about the consequences of Adam's sin. And for that, we're going to begin our lesson in verse 7, after Adam ate the forbidden fruit that the eyes of, them, uh, of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sawed fig leaves and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And now, verse nine. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? So first of all, we need to remember that God is omnipresent and omniscient. In other words, God knows everything and he's everywhere. Therefore, the man and the woman's effort to hide from the Lord is, they're absolutely futile. There's nothing hidden from the eyes of the Lord. God knew exactly what had happened, when it happened, how it happened, how did it, and what were the consequences of it all. So what we have here in the next verses is a series of questions. It's a series of rhetorical questions that further demonstrate God's character. So in this case, we're gonna see God's tender mercy and grace toward us. We're gonna see his fairness and his justice. The Lord, rather than forcefully commanding the man and the woman to come out from wherever they were hiding, instead of saying, come here immediately, like, I would do. God utilizes this series of questions to gently draw them out from wherever they were hiding and to allow them the opportunity or to, to take responsibility for their mistakes. So now notice how this question in verse 9 is not directed at both of them. It's both the man and the woman that are there. But God addresses Adam. He's asking the man, where are you? And the man responds in verse 10, oh, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so, so I hid myself. Adam clearly understood that what God was giving, the, giving him an opportunity to confess, to confess and to own what he had done, and so he did. Adam not only confessed, he also acknowledged his nakedness. The consequences of Adam's disobedience are evident. There is now uh, fear and there is shame in his heart and, and, and fear and, and, and shame are now uh, um, motivating him or driving him to hide from the presence of God. So the man is ashamed to appear in this condition, to appear guilty before God. He's, he's afraid and ashamed of appearing naked in front of his provider. So what we have here is a very clear illustration of how in a blink of an eye, Sin changed everything. Sin separates us from God. Sin changed our relationship with God from friendship to enmity, from, uh, 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 from loving creator to implacable judge. And God said in verse 11, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree for, of which I commanded you not to eat? Again, God is omniscient. He knows it all. So. This is a rhetorical question. 
And rather than charging the man with transgression, rather than saying, you disobeyed me, you ate, you did what I told you not to do, God provides the man with another opportunity to explain himself, to another opportunity to confess his crime. And while Adam did admit eating the forbidden fruit, he failed to take responsibility. Instead, in verse 12, Adam places the blame for his actions on the woman, and ultimately he has the audacity to blame it on God. So he says, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. What we need to notice here is how quickly things changed. Just a few verses ago, we read of how much joy the woman brought to the life of the man, and with her by his side, he was complete. They were in a, in a state of absolute joy. He even recited poetry saying, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. I mean, this is just the happiest of moments, and now everything has changed. Adam now places the blame for his actions on her, on the woman. And in fact, as I said, he has the audacity to insinuate that it is actually God's fault for putting the woman there with Adam, because if God, had not, uh, if God had not placed her there, if she hadn't been there with him in the first place, he would not, never have eaten. So it's God's fault for putting her there. And this logic, this selfish way of thinking, is still present in human beings at every stage of life today. That's how we are, all of us, beginning with me. No one likes to admit their guilt, although I do, although I do sometimes. But in general, no one likes to admit their guilt. Like Adam, our first reaction, even if it's just in our minds, is to shift, shift the blame to something or someone else. It's not my fault, something else, it's someone else's. And sin does not only separate us from God, as we see here with Adam and the woman, it separates us from one another. So, in verse 13, the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So, just as he had done with Adam, God now emphatically questions the woman, do you realize what you have done? Do you understand the magnitude of your action? Again, God is not seeking information. Instead, God's giving, God is giving her a chance to confess her transgression. And the woman did confess to eating the forbidden fruit, but sadly, following her husband's example, the woman now points the finger to the serpent. And what she said here was that she would never have eaten the fruit if the serpent had not deceived her. So it is the serpent's fault, not hers. It's the serpent. And while it is true that the serpent deceived her, this does not excuse her willful disobedience. The temptation might have been there, but she is the one who made the decision to take the fruit and eating it. So the Lord God said to the serpent in verse 14, because you have done this, Curse are you more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. Now notice here that there is a change in the attitude of the Lord. God did not ask any questions to the serpent. There was no opportunity for this reptile to explain itself. God simply turned to the serpent and cursed it. Period. No questions asked. And here is important to notice that no one else gets cursed except for the serpent and the ground. Adam and Eve will not be cursed, just the serpent and the ground. And what is important to know is that a curse is the exact opposite of a blessing. In the scripture, to curse means to invoke judge, the judgment of God upon someone for a particular reason. So for example, you know, a person could curse another person for disobeying God or for blaspheming God. And while this person can invoke the curse on another, the effectiveness of this curse depends exclusively on God to take effect. You may curse all you want, 
but God is the one who has to make the curse effective. God is the one who decides who will actually be cursed or not. And then in contrast with our passage here, what we see, what the, the, the most terrifying thing it is, it is that it is God himself who pronounces the curse against the serpent. And what this means is that the effectiveness of the curse is absolutely guaranteed. The curse will be fulfilled because God willed it too. There is no going back. This is happening. Now, the curse over the snake involves three aspects. The first aspect has to do with its locomotion, with the way the serpent moves around. The implication here is that the snake had previously walked with feet and legs, just like other animals. Now, instead, the serpent is going to have to crawl on its belly. That's what verse 14 says. Now, I do have to say here that throughout history, the history of the church, history of theology, there has been lots of controversy whether the snake had legs or not, whether it was an actual snake or just a reptile. That's, that's really not the point of this. The point is that the snake has been cursed. Now, the second aspect of the curse has to do with the manner in which the serpent obtains food. The one who tempted the woman to eat will now eat dust himself. This phrase, dust you will eat, does not mean that snakes will actually ingest dust for nutrition. Instead, it is figurative language signifying its total defeat, its severe humiliation. It's, it's not only his defeat and his humiliation, but also of his descendants. That's what this is uh, referring to. And then the third aspect of the, core, the curse involves its ultimate destiny, not only of the serpent, but also of its seed. The phrase, all the days of its life, speak of the ultimate end of the serpent and its descendants. The serpent, along with all those who have opposed God and rejected his kingdom, will ultimately be destroyed by the wounded seed of the woman. So with that said, with these three aspects of the curse over the serpent, it is important to understand that God's curses over the reptile are not directed against the snake per se. In other words, while the serpent is actually cursed, it is not the main object of the curses. And you may ask, well, why not? Well, because the serpent is merely a symbol of the evil responsible for tempting the woman. It's the, it's, the, it's the entity behind the serpent. So the curses are mainly directed to the adversary that is represented by the serpent. They're mainly directed to Satan. And to reiterate, these punishments reflect a limited time expectancy. They're filled with humiliation and subjugation in the natural wor world, and it all will end violently. Then in verse 15, we see both a promise of judgment for Satan, but also a promise of future delivery for those who belong to God. All of us here know that before the fall, the man and the woman had a friendship with God. They had fellowship with him in the garden. They walked together. They conversed. They enjoyed their, each other's company. Unfortunately, Adam ate the forbidden fruit, and sin, sin came into the world. And this destroyed their fellowship and changed their relationship with God. The man and the woman now became enemies of God and allies to Satan. This is very important to understand. They became enemies of God and Satan's allies. Whether they realized it or not, or whether they intended it or not, now they have a friendship with Satan. But God would not allow this change to be permanent. In the first half of verse 15, God said to the serpent, God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Now, unquestionably, this is a promise of judgment for Satan. It, that much is clear. But most importantly, this is also a promise of deliverance. It is a promise of redemption. It is a promise of restoration for the woman. This is why this verse is known as the Proto-Evangelium. This is the first gospel. What God is telling the serpent here is that God is going to redeem the woman, that God is going to make her righteous again, that God will save her from her sin, and that God would give her a new heart and a new mind in order to restore her relationship with God. This is what I was explaining, that they have a friendship with Satan at this moment in time. 
But God says, I am not, I'm, I'm going to take that friendship away and I'm going to make her your enemy. How? By saving her, by redeeming her, by restoring her relationship with me. The noun enmity refers to a strong hated or a long lasting hostility. And in this case, it signifies that there will be a spiritual struggle, that there will be a spiritual battle, not only between the woman and the serpent, but also between those who belong to Satan and the descendants of the woman. Then we have the promise of deliverance for God's people. This deliverance will come from one particular person. This deliverance is going to come from the Messiah, from the Savior, whom you and I know is Jesus Christ. Now, before I explain this promise of deliverance, I have to mention that the transition of the second half of this verse has been historically very difficult and very uh, problematic to translate. The issue here is the meaning of the Hebrew word shaf, which sometimes um, can be translated as to crush or to strike. Some other times you can translate as to bruise. And there's really no consensus among translators and, and modern commentators of which of these words or which of these meanings is actually appropriate to use. So if you look in your Bibles, uh, if you have a King James Version, a New King James, an English Standard, or an NASB, all of them correctly translate this root verb um, shaft as bruise. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. If you have an NIV, the NIV takes a little different approach, and it translates this same verb in two different ways in the same sentence. The NIV translator wrote, translators wrote, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now the only issue that we have with the NIV translator translation is that the NIV seems, I'm not saying that they do, but it seems that they place the emphasis on the head and the heel rather than emphasizing the serpent and the Messiah. So the argument is that you have to translate both words in the same manner for the same verse for this to have the correct emphasis. So with this in mind, I suggest that using the verb strike would be a little bit clearer because in my opinion, it better conveys the meaning of the author. So the, the, the verse would say, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. You keep two words the same and strike, I think it brings the meaning better, and it's still a correct translation, I would say. So as I previously mentioned, this is a promise of deliverance for God's people through the Messiah who will battle Satan and deliver a crushing and definitive defeat. And while both Satan and Christ will strike each other, they will do so in different parts of their bodies. And this is going to absolutely determine the severity and success of the attacks, because the strike that the Messiah will deliver would be on the head of the serpent. And the strike that the serpent will deliver on the Lord will be non-lethal. It would hurt, it would be painful, but it would not be fatal. So at some point when the, the serpent is uh, stricken, stricken in the head, um, it will be its end. The Satan, uh, Satan will be cast into the lake of fire where he will spend the rest of eternity. On the other hand, the Messiah will not die forever. So Christ is going to die on the cross, but he will be resurrected and then he's ascending to heaven. So he, just, he is just going to be wounded. It's not permanent, it's not fatal. So as soon as the Lord finished uttering these words, the man and the woman understood that God would not leave them in their fallen state forever. They understood that one day in the future, God would send a savior in order to reconcile them with him. And from that moment on, the man and the woman looked toward the coming of the redeemer. The man and the woman did not know any of the specifics that you and I know about the Messiah. They didn't know his name. They didn't know what he was going to look like. They didn't even know where he was coming from. They just knew and believed in God's 
promise. They believed in their heart that a savior was going to come to rescue them. Just from this verse, they knew exactly what God meant. A savior will come to get you. And here we see, we need to emphasize that this is God's plan. It is not ours. We did not come up with this plan. So Lord, when you send us a savior, Lord, why don't you do something about this? We, that was not at, us, at all our plan. Our plan was to hide. Our plan was just to dig a hole and stay there. God is who came looking for them. It was God who knew what had happened, and it was, knew who, it was God who knew and provided what they needed according to his perfect plan and his perfect will. Salvation, as we can see here, has always been by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. He is the only Savior. Sadly and painfully, even though they know this, sin still has consequences. So there is a promise of a Savior, and that's a happy, happy thing. That, that, that's, that's hope for the future. But in the meantime, there is sin that has to be dealt with. And it will have sad and painful consequences. In verse 16, God addresses the woman first. And he says to her, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. As I mentioned before, God only cursed the serpent, and he will, a little bit later, will curse the ground. In the case of the man and the woman, God is issuing a decree or a declaration of how life would be for them from now on. From now on, there will be disruption of their God-appointed roles. For the woman, there are going to be two consequences that affect two of her God-given roles. And the first consequence now has to do with maternity. The woman was created to be a suitable helper and the mother of children. And while the woman will continue with her role as childbearer, she will now experience physical and emotional agony. It's not pain, it's agony. It's, it's a strong pain during childbirth. Therefore, for the woman, every birth will be a painful reminder of her role in the fall of man. However, in God's infinite mercy and grace, every childbirth will also be a source of hope, a reminder of God's promise that through her, God would send a savior. Now, the second consequence has to do with marriage. God said to the woman, your desire will be for your husband but he will overrule you. Here the conjunction and can also be translated as but. So I think it's a little bit better we say, but your husband, but he will rule over you. And as we know, both the man and the woman were created in the image of God. And while God did give man authority over the woman, we said last time we met, this does not make the woman inferior to the man, they're both equal. Adam was given supremacy and dominion over the animals, not over Eve. He's not superior to her, and she's not superior to him. They are equal image bearers of God. And as image bearers, both man and woman were created by God to share not only the responsibility of having dominion over the created order, but also to share the enjoyment of all of God's promises and blessings. This is the, 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 the original design. But as I said, everything changed. And now things are going to change for Eve, for the woman, in the second half of verse 16. God tells us that there is going to be a struggle for mastery. There is going to be a battle for control between the husband and the wife. Here, the Hebrew noun chuka, translated as desire, describes an attempt to control, an attempt to dominate. 
So the woman's desire is going to be to control her husband. She will try to have authority over him. She's going to try to make him submit to her. But she's going to fail because this is not the pattern that God established for marriage. God has ordained a man to have authority over the woman. God declared the man to be the head, to be the leader of the relationship. And here is going to be the conflict. The woman is going to try to take that position. The woman's desire is going to be for control over her husband, but he will rule over her. The Hebrew word, verb mashal can be translated into English as to reign or to rule, to exercise authority or to have dominion. But in this context, the word rule, the verb rule, speaks of a harsh and exploitive subjugation. In other words, the husband is going to exercise his authority over his wife, but not in a loving way, but in a tyrannical way. It's a harsh way to rule to exercise dominion the hard way. From this moment on, the relationship now would be a fierce dispute between the husband and the wife. Those who once reigned in harmony and equality as one are now going to compete to rule the other. And this conflict between the sexes is now an unfortunate characteristic of human nature. In his commentary, Dr. Alan Ross said, the woman at her worst would be a nemesis to the man, and the man at his worst would dominate the woman. And if we're honest about ourselves in our marriages, what happens between closed doors, you know that this is the truth. We have all have those thoughts. We have all have those impulses. This is where all has its origin. But again, in God's infinite grace and mercy, when a husband is transformed by faith in Jesus Christ, he receives a new heart that allows him and compels him to love his wife in a sacrificial manner, just as Jesus Christ loves the church. And something similar happens to the wife when by faith in Christ she receives a new heart, she submits to her husband just like the church submits to the Lord Jesus Christ. Only then will there be cooperation between two equals who seek to glorify God through their marriage. It is only through Christ that things start becoming more like God intended. Back in our text, in verses 17 through 19, God said to Adam, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which, about which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat from it, Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Here the Hebrew verb shama, that is translated in our Bibles as listened, conveys the idea of complying or obeying. So the issue here is that Adam obeyed his wife rather than God by eating the fruit that God had commanded him not to eat. God said, do not eat the fruit. The woman said, eat it. And Adam made a choice to obey her rather than God. Adam was not deceived. He did not refuse his wife's offer as he should have. He willfully disobeyed God's command, bringing sin into the world. And as a consequence of Adam's willful disobedience, God cursed the ground. Before the fall, if you remember, the garden was given to Adam as a source of life. It was a source of pleasure and joy, but now, the ground is going to become the source of pain and yield thorns and thistles. The ground who once was Adam's servant has now become his enemy. Adam is no longer able to freely eat from any tree of the garden because he is about to get expelled from the garden. 
He's now going to suffer a life of toil, toilsome labor, a life of hardship and frustration in order to fulfill his role as the worker of the land. Even worse, the man is going to ultimately experience death. God sentences the man to death, saying that Adam must return to the ground from which he was taken. The expulsion from the garden signifies separation from God and closeness to death. So these are the reasons why there's quarrel and disputes between husbands and wives. This is the reason why for men, work is difficult. Whether you work at an office or a school or a church, there is difficulty in earning your living. This is the reason why. Work is not a result of the fault, of the, of, of the fall. Work is a good thing. That's how Adam, that's how we were, fi- were supposed to find fulfillment and joy. Work now has become the opposite of fulfilling and joyful. This is a new reality. Nothing is the way God intended it to be. This is the beginning of what we, what we now call the fallen world. God is holy, right, righteous, and just, and he cannot and he will not allow sin and disobedience to go unpunished. Sin must be paid for either by us or by someone else. That is it. This is not something that you can, you know, sweep under the rug. This is not like mom and dad when, when you do something and they don't say anything to your father so that you don't have to suffer the consequences. The mom will help you. The mom will take over. The mom will cover you and she would just keep it between you and them. And later on in life, this becomes a funny story. Remember that thing that was broken that all, oh, it was actually me, but mom never, never told you. That's not at all what is going to happen here. Sin and disobedience will be punished. The serpent, well, in God's mercy mercy and grace, and his love is shown here because even though these are declarations of of a change in our lives, things are not going to stop. God did not just erase everything, wiped us out, and moved on. The serpent will continue to exist The woman will still be able to bear children, and the ground will still yield food for the man. It's going to be difficult. It is going to be different. It's going to be painful. But these things are going to continue to happen until one day when the Savior comes to rescue us and delivers us from our sins and restores our relationship with God. So that's another mercy that God didn't just say, away with you, gone, forever. I'm going to start over. Those of us who have trusted in Jesus Christ for our salvation, there's no question. We stand forgiven before, before God. And yet, we do need to remember that none of us is above temptation. I remember a sermon from Mark Newman from a number of years ago where he said, that all of us were just a second away from falling. All of us. No one is above temptation. Satan is an evil and powerful adversary who prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And you know, sadly, as we just saw two weeks ago, a man's occupation, a man's prominence, popularity, professional or social connections will not prevent, much less cancel, the real, painful, and lasting consequences of sin. Temptation doesn't know anything about hierarchy or name. Not at all. As we just saw with Adam, sin and disobedience could cost you everything. Let me pray for us.
Father, we thank you for the blessing that it is to know that you are merciful and gracious and that you're also holy and just and righteous. And Lord, we know that sin will not go unpunished. So we ask you, Lord, that you will allow us to draw closer to you. If there's anyone here that has not yet trusted in Christ for their salvation, that has not trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, that you would make this the day of their salvation. And Lord, for all of us who are saved, Lord, would you allow us to draw closer to you? This is something that we say over and over again, but it is the truth. And you have sent warnings through your word and through the life experiences of the consequences of sin. And we ask you, Lord, that you would spare us from that, that you would allow us to remain strong in the faith. Lord, we know that temptation is strong and it comes in many different ways, especially in this area of technology. So we ask for your protection and guidance Lord, would you please help us to, to do everything to your honor and glory. 